coming up on Theater Talk. Anybody have anything they want to say for Escape to, to, from, to, from <laughs> Margaret <laughs> Rome? It is the kind of show that I refer to as a wrist slitter. Okay, <laughs> wrist slitter. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and I am joined by my co-host, Jesse Green, co-chief theater critic of the New York Times. And we are here to review the best of the spring season with three of Jesse's critic colleagues, Peter Marks of The Washington Post, Terry Teachout of The Wall Street Journal, and Ben Brantley, also the co-chief theater critic. Yeah, this is thrilling for me. Time. So nice to meet you. Jeff. You look <laughs> familiar. Yeah, I'm Mike, I'm no. this best part. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're covering oh, the no. best no, the, of the spring the, so much as the best and the, what to the avoid. The peaks and valleys and that <laughs> the eternal that plateau happened. that is Broadway. Well, so yeah. let's let's begin. Oh, why don't we begin with what I think you might consider a peak? There were uh, there was a, one huge blockbuster of an opening this spring: uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. What's our take on that? I mean, I think I'm in the minority in this group. I loved it. I'd seen it in London. Uh, the theatrical, the idea of being able to translate a very specific narrative voice into purely theatrical terms, as I think this did, uh, was to me magic. And uh, I think you said earlier, Jesse, it puts the production values of, of Disney to shame. And you never see the seams at any point. Things just seem to happen organically. But, um, did, yeah. did, did uh, Were other people as impressed with the play itself? No. Um, I, uh, I, maybe I made the mistake of reading the script uh, when it came out. <laughs> Was that a word in, in quotation marks? <laughs> well, it came out in book form. Yeah. Uh, I will say also that I was a Harry Potter devotee. Uh, my daughter brought me up on Harry Potter. We read the books together and saw the movies together, so we both had this. She's now 25, so she's, uh, she's an adult herself, and she had the same reaction I did to the book, which was underwhelmed. And then so I came in sort of wondering what they were going to be doing with this story, and I felt it was really Harry Potter light. It was fan fiction. Um, the, one of the great things about the, the books and the movies were that they were all really wonderful detective stories. And I felt like this was really just kind of a retrospective, oh, no. uh, a pandering essentially to the, uh, to the fan base. And anyone else, for me anyway, uh, was gonna feel kind of cheated. I'm a Harry Potter as I'm a Harry Potter agnostic. I've read some of the books. I saw a couple of the movies. I don't have strong feelings either way. I wasn't completely at sea. I think anybody who was not very familiar going in would have been totally at sea. And I did some asking about that. I liked the magic. I kept waiting for the songs. It, the whole <laughs> thing is structured like a musical. Mm. Looks and feels like one. Would have been better if it had been musical. Oh, it would have yeah. been something to listen to. I mean, to me, it actually got the rush of, of, of J.K. Rowling's prose. And I think what she shares with another best-selling uh, middle-level popular novelist, Stephen King, is to take the most generic sort of pedestrian, you know, I don't get along with my father kind of situations. Uh, and give them this kind of nimbus of... Well, Stretched out to six hours yeah. of I, 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 I was in heaven father. through all of it. Well, as long the as... magic we... is amazing, though, and yeah, the stage much tricks must be are said great. about it. The, yeah, but they also do each the, trick three times. But the black magic is the best part. I, I'm a real devotee of, of black on black stage manipulation. Mm -hmm. And that was great. And it was used with amazing oh, virtuosity. Oh, the way they fly off the, uh, right, the so staircases? I have like 12, yeah. 15 good minutes, you know? <laughs> I, I am want? going to say, in terms of the plot, I won't give away the secrets, but those of you who are Star Trek fans may detect a similarity to one of its most legendary episodes. Well, uh, <laughs> leaving that six-hour yes. uh, <laughs> dinner break uh, entertainment uh, for another one, uh, also with a certain amount of supernaturalism, let's talk about Angels in America, part one and part two, which uh, I think most of us if, if not all of us saw uh, yep. in one in day. One city, in yeah. a city. Yeah. She's approaching. Which is really the way to see that show. Yes. 
Uh, it, in fact, it's the only way I've seen it. Well, actually, I didn't see it in one day, and that, and, and that was fine. Did, well, you oh, couldn't yeah. when it opened on Broadway the first time. Yeah, right, they because they opened months yeah, apart. Right. Part two, yeah. right, yeah. right, right. He still may not have finished part two. Yeah. This is the latest iteration of Perestroika. Right. Oh, he'll be working on it in the grave. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone have problems with the special effects or the Dementors in Angels in America, or were, were you pretty satisfied with this production? You know, it was slick for me, the production. And part of this response comes from the fact that I have now seen in two different cities two different small-scale productions of Angels in America. I think the show works better on a small scale. Mm -hmm. it, it gains in constant. The spatial concentration has the effect of tightening it up. And uh, uh, that aspect of it didn't thrill me. What I found utterly fascinating was Nathan Lane not this looking or acting or sounding like Roy Cohn. And I loved that because it's time. The play is now mm -hmm. a history play. Uh, there aren't, probably aren't that many people in the audience anymore who really remember, mm. as, as all of us do, what Cohn looked like and sounded like. It's time to, to pull the plug on that and to come from a different direction. And I, I don't know if it was the ideal way to do it, but it was done with great brilliance and great original. And a fully imagined performance. I think Completely, that's true, yeah. top to bottom. And I, w I think, interestingly, I was really skeptical about Marianne Elliott directing Angels in America. You know, she's obviously well known for Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime and for War Horse. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, staged as opera, this piece is glorious. Mm -hmm. um, I think these are huge perform. These are big characters. I forgot how big they are. I was really, really happy during these. I thought it went like that. Yeah, no, I felt that way. Too. And I'd also, um, I mean, addressing your point, Terry, when I saw it in London, it did feel lost in space because it was the stage of the, um, was it the, it was the Olivier, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. And it was just vast and they hadn't quite worked out uh, the lighting just felt like sort of almost punctuation marks along the way, those fluorescent Dan Flavin-like bulbs. <laughs> but um, it was, this actually seemed m almost intimate to me by comparison. I can see that it would, yeah. And I also liked the fact that, I liked the physical relationships among all the characters. I, I thought you got so much of a Pryor's relationship with um, Lewis, with Lewis just from the way they lay back what? on each other at the beginning. And then, and their instinct when they'd see each other again, even when they were mad, was still to gravitate like that. And it's, I thought that was really, all the way through. It's yeah. easy to forget how small Angels is. It's a small number of people. Mm -hmm. There's usually never more than two people right. on stage at any given moment. Right. When I, I saw it in Chicago, down by the Court Theater, Charlie Newell directed it there. And when you walked into this 350-seat house, what you saw at the center was, what do you call it, a, a catafalque? I can't remember how you pronounce that. You know, that you put a coffin on, mm -hmm. which ended up being used as Cone's desk, mm. as a deathbed. Oh, a hospital bed, too. Uh, and it was just amazing mm. that, that this, this shrunk down something new happens to the play. What something did you think about what she did with the end of part two, where they sort of went into the, I mean, she reimagined not only the angel, but then in that, that scene where they were, you know. In heaven? Where were they? In heaven, yeah. right. but it was. I liked it. I yeah. did too. Very I thought it was a theatrically really uh, interesting. I thought uh, many of the choices were wonderful. I thought turning the angel into basically a dirty New York pigeon yeah. Uh, <laughs> was a great idea. I thought it had just a well, lot of... Call me old-fashioned, but... Uh, you like a, like a yeah. white pigeon? <laughs> and and a there's, white where I, there's where I want the opera. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, th I thought there were a lot of moments... Although thematically it makes sense to have yeah. a dirty pigeon. Correct. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, angels ain't what they used to be. Well, Tony true, true. I, I, all right, this is my one touch of camp, you know. Give me. <laughs> Jesse's about to opine. What did you say? No, no, I'm here as a co-host, oh, not, not as a critic, so oh, I have dear. no opinions on the matter. But <laughs> yeah, it's true. You never seem to have opinions. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did not love this production. I thought it was baggy and uh, overacted. So there you go. I'm glad you wrote the review, Ben. Uh, <laughs> and I guess they, they are, are too. too. Yeah. Yeah. Boxed, we have boxed the compass of it. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> we, uh, there were a lot. I don't think Angels in America counts as a brand yet in American theater, although one day it might be. Uh, and You're not selling I would, shirts yet. I wonder what the oh, extensions will be. They are. Oh, are they really? Oh, my. oh, every girl in Angel Wings. You, you, it's going to be lovely. Um, <laughs> boys but, too. What do you mean? And boys too. But yeah, a lot. I don't and, like and the sexism. I'm I, well, you. let's talk about Frozen, <laughs> shall we? Um, and the other uh, heavily branded shows, uh, 
mostly musicals, although in the case of Harry Potter, uh, not a, right. not oh, a musical branded. except a pseudo musical. A pseudo musical, as Terry would have it. So we we had this spring alone. We had. Frozen, uh, based on the Disney animated movie. We had the Donna Summer musical based on her catalog, which is, uh, you know, owned by some of the producers of the musical. And we had my favorite, Escape to Margaritaville. <laughs> I keep saying Escape from Margaritaville. Yeah, I can't happen. help myself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let us not forget Mean Girls, which is owned by Lauren Michaels, who's branding it like crazy. Yeah. Although I would argue that Mean Girls is kind of in a separate category because it is a traditional movie to stage adaptation in many ways oh, dear God. but the has a traditional is well, I thought you were talking yeah, about branding but, but like the others has a has a sort of dedicated fan base all right. a certain all right. well, demographic like where, and where people can quote the lines I mean, all right. they, all right. I mean they, they were people what talking along and, and, and by lines. the refrigerator magnets okay right. so then then we're going to bulk these all together <laughs> uh, oh, and, and SpongeBob excuse me and SpongeBob oh my god <laughs> and SpongeBob built on the empire of uh, the animated cartoon mm -hmm. uh, so are there any shows in this group that you would stand up for and say, I I'm with it? Not I'm, me. I vote for this show. I, I would stand up for SpongeBob. Tell us why. Um, because, again, I thought uh, it was taking... I mean, what I find, have always found sort of dispiriting about Disney productions, aside from The Lion King, is that two-dimensional characters become one-dimensional when they take them to the stage. The quirks that you hear in the mm -hmm. voices of the uh, the actors who assume the parts of the animals, you know, uh, in the movies, it's all gone. It's somehow they become cardboard. Whereas SpongeBob actually using theater, and I think Tina Landau, you know, who seemed like an out of left field choice for it, really interpreted it into theatrical terms mm -hmm. in a wild and crazy and ultimately rather accurately reflective way. They may have done themselves a disservice um, um, by calling it SpongeBob SquarePants mm -hmm. the Musical. How so? Well, because it limits, I think it limits them in terms of uh, how, how the world perceives what they're going to be exposed to. You know, it, it, if in fact there is there are m more interesting ideas sort of developed in this about how people get along and, and, and the relationships between these characters, which are a little deeper than, you know, some of these other um, mm. uh, 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 brand name musicals, I think maybe it, you know, that if they have a struggle finding an adult audience for this show that isn't people who, you know, grew up on the show, it's because th the name is really off-putting. Well, three but in, tall sponges. <laughs> it could have been anything. And I mean, there was a great tradition. Who's you know, going to give you permission to do that? Well, uh, I, that's yeah. why these shows exist. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, in the, in, once upon a time, the, the tradition was you didn't call Pygmalion yeah, in yeah, the musical. Yeah. You called it My Fair Lady. You found an identity for it separate from uh, its roots. But well, although but, I actually hate Rodgers and Hammerstein's carousel in quotation well, marks. I agree. Oh, Edward, 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 Edward Albee's Three, three, three tall, tall Women. women. Oh. I agree. That doesn't but, really But, but these classics that we were mentioning were created by individual artists who had a passion for the original material. That's mm -hmm. a very different setup as Terry, I believe, but is. They also subjected the original material without exception to an imaginative transformation. Right. And therefore, they almost always renamed it. Mm. Uh, I mean, when you look at what Oscar Hammerstein did to all of the properties that he worked mm -hmm. with, I mean, something new has happened. The magic wand has been applied. That's not how these new shows right. work. They right. exist no, to be true. like the movie. Well, are there? You know, they even called. I mean, you know, the, the story of Adam and Eve was called the Apple Tree. I mean, you know, what I mean, yeah. it's yeah. like you know, you didn't have to. You could grant to the audience the idea that they can, uh, they can go along with you somewhere else than where the thing. Well, that actually, would have had to have been called Genesis Book. Exactly. <laughs> they would have today would be called the Bible Show. <laughs> but the, um, but <laughs> then My Fair Lady, which of course is famous for being in many ways quite close to Pygmalion, right. is nevertheless profoundly different from Well, merely so, by the addition of 14 songs, you, you can't help it. Now, what it about this production I, of My Fair Lady? Oh, but wait, can I just yeah. stand up for Mean Girls I was going to say, second? is there anything yes. else on the list someone will stand up for? Over to you, Now, I, I, I saw it, you know, I, it's Stockholm Syndrome a little bit. I saw it in Washington. I watched it <laughs> grow up from something that was pretty um, I thought, weak. I think that's and he, wrote, he strong, wrote one of those checklist reviews. Maybe it's called given an 11 Broadway o'clock number to <laughs> blah, blah, yeah, well, and they followed every single... <laughs> well, I will say that it's got a that uh, Tina Fey uh, wrote a book for the show that I think it stands on its own as I funny. I like the book. Yeah. As funny. Uh, and the music is not... The music it's is not, generic. It's, and it's and not, there's so much of it. Uh, it's, sure I mean, but I think it's actually a musical comedy that is entertaining and fun and 
I don't think it's a Tony winning musical, but I thought it was no. uh, an enjoyable it's piece. It's the kind of music, there's, now there's two kinds of music on Broadway. There's Disney music, and then there's synthetic pop. This was synthetic mm -hmm. pop. I just don't disagree. Switch in position two. Well, I don't disagree. Uh, so I'm um, just again looking at these five musicals that we're kind of glomming <laughs> together. Anybody have anything they want to say for Escape to, to, from, to, from, Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. It, it is the kind of show that I refer to as a wrist slitter. Okay, <laughs> wrist slitter. That's what you I, want to do. I see that on the marquee. Like see, I thought Donna Summer was a wrist slitter. Escape from Margaritaville was just a sleeping pill. It was just, <laughs> I mean, the wrist litters are more interesting Well, Donna Summer, <laughs> Donna Summer had the virtues of A, brevity, and B, Lachans. And that's about the size of it. So what we haven't, one more in this category is Frozen. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah>. What, what's <laughs> happening with Disney here? You, you gave your analysis right. of the problem of, of moving these animated characters onto the stage, but Disney has more uh, resources behind it in terms of money, certainly, but also talent. They can have anybody they want, the, the, the greatest technical work you could imagine, and yet it paled terribly in comparison to the technical work in Harry Potter, oh, as Hatchery right. said. I think, I think part of the thing with a Disney musical is there is so much at stake in, um, in, in, in abiding by the success of what was done mm. on the screen yeah. that it really does narrow desperately what theater artists can bring to the process because I, whether or not there's a lot of corporate thumbs on the show mm. or not, uh, you are hamstrung by this hundred million, two hundred million dollar. But look what Julie Tamar did back in the day. Yes. That's different what's time. So interesting. There was no track record back then. I'll tell yeah. you something kind of else. The original properties are changing as well. When we first started to get Disney musicals, I would say that the target market was what, 13, 14, 15? I had actually never even seen the film of Frozen until the week before I went to the show. I figured it was my job to see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And it was for four, five, and six. And that's what the show is for, too. What are you going to do with a show like that? The, the elbow room for imaginative transformation is limited, mm -hmm. aside from all these other problems. It just seemed to me like a bad property. Well, well let's all say that, that, that Frozen is not for any of us. No, absolutely not. I brought my daughter to that one, not to invoke Lizzie again. but um, And she was quite, and she's, she's really uh, discerning, uh, but she was quite satisfied. Yeah, and that's and an it, it, it met her that's expectations. An perspective. And I brought a Donna them, Summer fan to see Donna. Or and, and your daughter is and, 70, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's jump away from musicals for a moment because they, they seem so positively successful. Um, and <laughs> Ben's go, visit, by the way. Oh, yeah, right, sorry. which was not this yes. spring, but yeah. I think we're which all pretty much real musical. It's on its own level. It's Everything winner. that musicals oh, yeah. ought to be oh, today yeah, so, will yeah. last. So there, we've dealt with that in five seconds. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, going to the other plays uh, that opened this spring, uh, there was a pretty good slate of play revivals mm -hmm. and perhaps not as rich a slate of new plays, but some good ones to talk all about. All scared away by Harry Potter. All every, Do you think that oh, yeah. happened? The totally. producers just totally. said, let's wait till the fall? Yes, I think they said this is... We're going to all be railroaded. And that's only because and they of the were Tony Awards. smart to do that. Yes, all that Tony Awards, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so there's no point in doing a play on Broadway unless you can win a Tony Award, is what producers Well, unless think. it's a well, little more of a, fa of a well, playing field, yeah. an open playing field. It doesn't. also depends yeah. on the nut. I mean, if you can do a show and it's not that expensive and it's got a fixed end and, it, and you know it's, it's a serious piece of work and you don't open it in April, then you're not going to make it money okay. off it, but at least you're going to make other but, things. But, I mean, I know um, the children, which unfortunately I didn't see, but like very much in the reading of it, I mean, didn't move. I mean, there was never any talk of its moving. It it's, couldn't have yep. moved. It was, yeah. at, it was at a Broadway right. house, although Manhattan Theater Club, so it, it has its subscription audience. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think, the best play of the year, um, even including Harry Potter. Uh, but that's the end of that. We'll never see that again in mm. New York. Uh, but perhaps well, I, it'll have a life elsewhere. Let's let's take a different off-Broadway example. Mary Jane, Amy Herzog's mm -hmm. play, very well thought of by most critics, including myself. The New York Drama Critics, critics Circle just gave it the mm -hmm. best, best play, play. Of the year. It's never going to move. Thirty years ago, it would have been. Thirty years ago, it would have opened cold on Broadway. The world is different. 
Yeah. And yet I hear people who say, I know someone who's been going to theater for, and went to Yale Drama School, has been going to theater for literally 50 or 60 years, saw the band's visit and said, but it seems so small for Broadway. Mm. And, uh, you know, how do you answer that? You don't. They too have been conditioned yeah. by the... Uh... Well, let's talk about some of the revivals that, in one of which did start off Broadway in a smaller production and has been... Uh, in a way recreated without very much change. I'm talking about Three Tall Women. Um, Although I think there's a bit there, of change. There is a bit of change. There's some structural, design. beautiful oh. uh, adjustments that would never have been allowed if Albie were alive. But um, mm -hmm. Oh, and can we say what no one has seemed to have said in a review that is the boy who comes on? Oh, we... we do we say that? Of course we can, yeah. Okay. It's a ringer for Edward Albee. Yes, he does uh, for the young exactly Edward look like the young Albee. Uh, <laughs> Um, hard to get to why that's important in the play if you don't know the play. But right. Except it's a memoir basically about his mother. It's yeah. a, I mean, not a memoir, but an, an evocation of his mother it's at different phases of her life. Very imaginative and serious production. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the design as much as, as you guys did, but it was fine. Mainly, I liked it because you had three remarkable performers, beautifully directed, in a great play. Yeah. And and also the thrill, I mean, just for theater and film aficionados of seeing Glenda Jackson mm -hmm. after not having been on Broadway in 30 oh. years, not having been on stage, period, except for King Lear in between for <laughs> 23 years. When just she was in Parliament. King Lear. When I walked Walking out of the theater that night, was it you that I didn't recognize? There was somebody I know well, mm -hmm. and I was, it wasn't you, mm -hmm. it was actually one of my colleagues at the Journal, and I was so completely still in the world of the play that somebody I know very well was standing next to me and it didn't hit me. That's how involving yeah. that should well, that, that's, be. Let's put that on the marquee. Good for your amnesia. Ah. <laughs> um, an, another off, formerly off-Broadway play that had its Broadway premiere and counts as a revival is Lobby Hero oh, by Kenneth Lonergan. Yeah. What a I think we all thought it was. Well, I don't know what oh. you thought, Terry, but loved we it. Uh, yeah. loved it. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful um, version. I think it's better than the original. Oh, no stuff. question. Well, I think that's partly because of Mike. I, I love this cast, but Michael um, Sarah. Sarah is... This, this cast would have been, as you've said, a good... Uh, a reason to have a category that some actors, that Actors' ensemble, Equity is right, asking right, for, and let's for just, Best Ensemble. Let's also say that the um, the emergence of second stage theater onto Broadway, mm -hmm. they've taken over the now called the Hayes Theater as opposed to the Helen Hayes. I don't get that at all. It depends on uh, which website you get. Yeah, right. Uh, but the this nonprofit theater is now joins Roundabout Manhattan Theater Club in Lincoln Center on Broadway and promises to be a place where you're going to see some serious theater. You're going to see Straight White Men by Young Jean Lee right. this summer. Um, they're actually bringing Although back actually, and you don't see Straight White Men at the theater very much. Just here. But I think that this is a, a, a really wonderful indication of where they're going to yeah, go they with this. With a high card. Yeah, I'm going to throw out into the into the yes. fish pond here travesties Ace and uh, let's Yay. talk about Iceman Cometh. Travesties <laughs> is um, I, when I saw it when I was 19 years old I hadn't even read the importance of being earnest at the time so I had no idea what I was watching I didn't realize what a great play I was watching and this time I was transported and I thought also it was, it's so De Patrick Marber did such a fabulous yes. job. Oh, yeah. Oh. And and I and and I was so much more interested in the lore which is revealed in travesties than the lore of Harry Potter. Uh, you know, I mean, good for you. <laughs> well, yeah, you're a great. I like yeah, that. I'm a, I mean, I was riveted by travesties right. and 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 and. and People, that's a really one. Go and see it. Yeah. When you're a Tony presenter this year, Susan, say that. Yes, I'll be up there. <laughs> well, I have a countercultural opinion on both St. John and Iceman, which is that they are both the casts are both led by very gifted actors who I thought were not well cast. Denzel Washington, I, I don't really see as a great stage actor at all. Oh, I thought so he was. So even riveting. though it was a wonderful was so production, good. I thought it was dead at the same. I, oh, I thought that final monologue where they just he just brings the chair to the stage. It was the first time that I'd seen that monologue yes. done where it wasn't the spiel. I mean, suddenly he became every man. Yes. And I thought that was... That was a, a brilliant piece of staging. Movie. Yeah. For me, having seen all the, the, the live hickeys except for James Earl Jones, mm. he was the strongest. Mm. Yeah, I thought he was great. Now, we're dead out of time, but let's throw out the three revivals. Two of them were this spring. Those were, of course, Carousel, uh, Carousel and My Fair Lady, and one of them opened in the fall. And that was Once on this Island. Which uh, was delightful. Oh, 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 I liked much about all of them. How about you guys? I didn't much care for the Carousel revival. 
my fair lady, I thought that, that she was wonderful, he not so, and that's not the show. I mean, this was an attempt to create a, a My Fair Lady. I think you're like getting your neck lady. cut off by <laughs> Peter. No, I was going to say, everybody's all over the map on these it's shows. The yeah, they're 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 awesome. Nobody so in New York divisive. agrees yeah. on proves, It proves how interesting yeah. they are. That's I, I thought Mueller was wonderful in Carousel, Jesse Mueller as yeah. Julie oh, Jordan. Oh, gosh, yes. I'm, I thought on, I'm on board with Mendes that. Mendes yeah. and Alex Gemignani were fantastic. Um, yeah, that was the best Mr. and Mrs. Snow. Yeah, no, my problem was the staging. I thought the second act, I don't think he knew that, what to do with that, Jack O'Brien. Yeah, yeah. But I, the first act was magic. I liked My Fair Lady a lot. Point of view. And I had more pro I admired My Fair Lady, but I felt detached from it throughout. And That's I liked a him. Good way yeah. to I liked his thing. Harry Haddon Peyton. I, we learned, we learned how to say his <laughs> name, and, yeah. and viewers should know this now. You, you think ham and bacon. That's what he told us. <laughs> Haddon <laughs> Bacon. And, and on that deeply critical note, <laughs> I, I think we, we have to We call must say goodbye to the three tall critics. Oh. <laughs> ben Brantley of the New York Times. A.K.A. Glenda Jackson. That's right. <laughs> Harry Teachout of the Wall Street Journal and Peter Marks of the Allison Washington Till. Post. Thank you so much. A trip on my lawn. What does this make me? <laughs> Laurie Metcalf. Not a bad <laughs> Not too shabby. No. And, and, and I'll be the, and I'm the young, young Edward Albee. <laughs> Jesse, so Jesse Green, thank you so very much. Thank you, Susan. Onward into the, to the new season. Absolutely. Why can't the English teach their children how to speak? This verbal class distinction by now should be antique. If you spoke as she does say instead of the way you do, why, you might be selling flowers too. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.